Okay, everybody, I think we are live. So um, it's a pleasure to have Anatoly, John, and Neil here today. Um, these gentlemen need no introduction, but uh, in case you don't know them, Anatoly is a co-founder of Solana. John is a partner and co-founder of DBA, and Neil is the founder of Eclipse. I'm Nick, I'm the CEO of Celestia Labs. Today, the title of the discussion is Modular Meets Monolithic. So a lot of people think of modular and monolithic as kind of opposing communities with different philosophies about what blockchains are for, how they should be designed. But um, Eclipse announced a few weeks ago that they're launching this SVM layer two that combines elements of modular and monolithic blockchain ecosystems, building on top of Ethereum, Celestia, and, and uh, uh, Solana at the same time. And so the, the point of today's discussion is to use Eclipse as a starting point to explore where modular and monolithic you know, might actually have some common ground or where they are actually different, um, how these different philosophies can be aligned and benefit each other. And in general, just you know, talk about how uh, Eclipse is going to be potentially benefiting all three of them so that Solana, Ethereum, Celestia don't necessarily have to be competitive. You know, there's actually a win-win-win here. Um, and so the, the first thing that I want to start out with is just generally to set the stage. Uh, I want to hear from each of you guys about what you think the trade-offs and differences in philosophy are between monolithic and modular blockchains. And then where do Ethereum, Solana, and Celestia sit within that, that spectrum? And, and as a result, like which, what trade-offs do they make? And uh, I think uh, just to also kind of add some context, I think of obviously Anatoly bringing the Solana perspective. Um, I, I can bring in the, the Celestia perspective and, and John. Uh, I know you're, you're all over the place, but maybe today you can be a representative of the Ethereum community. Uh, and obviously, Neil, you're, you're representing kind of the, the mix or like an outside perspective uh, and, and representing Eclipse. But yeah, let's start there. What, what do you think? We're like, let's, let's frame this debate around modular and monolithic and Ethereum, Solana and, and Celestia. So, um, totally, you want to you start off? Sure. Well, I think like we kind of, the, the way that the Solana is designed and the way that we really think about it is that there's this one really core problem that we want to solve and that's how to synchronize information globally. And there's nothing to do with runtimes. There's nothing to do with blockchains or anything. It's just that if you, if you, if you've ever traded, if you ever used any like kind of like, you know, API and interactive brokers or whatever, you get a streaming data from these markets and you submit orders. And if somebody delays the data that you receive, they have an edge. Somebody delays how you submit the order or gets to look at it and, and route it and stuff. They have an edge. And this is something that I found really annoying as an amateur trader. And this is something that permissionless public blockchains solve and can solve in a way that's competitive with the best centralized systems. And this is kind of like, I think the key part that most people don't understand is that like, even if something trades at nanosecond speeds, information still has to propagate around the world. Some news event happens in Singapore, that news wire travels to, <laughs> to, to, to a poorly run desk at some, at some magazine, and then they publish the wrong tweet. That data still has to propagate around the world. And by the time it reads, like hits like a trader's desk with their terminal and they see the, the news wire, they need to look at markets that have already reflected that price. And in a, the way that Solana is designed is that if there's a market running on Solana and a market running at NASDAQ, they should have the exact same price because as soon as that news event happens, say it happens in Singapore, there should be a transaction starting from Singapore that's propagating around the world that reflects that, that change. And that means that like we've achieved this like parity of the noise in the world, <laughs> right? Like is now fully synchronized in, in one spot. And that's the dream. That's what we're building for. And from my perspective, it was just like kind of a coincidence that all this other stuff happened, that like Ethereum exists as a settlement blockchain, that there's this meme for store of values for, for Bitcoin and stuff like that. I think all these things are really, really cool. But like the, the core problem is that information sync problem so you can't like like if there's a better design like if all of a sudden 
the like Celestia just did a better job of that. We would just swap everything out for Celestia's coat. <laughs> that would be like my my engineering kind of like decision. Be like, oh yeah, cool. That's a better design. Obviously, why didn't we think of it? <laughs> Boy, are we dumb. Let's it's all open source code. Let's rewrite it and, and make it better. Got it. And so the 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 trade offs of things that you guys emphasize is is like latency and and. Like, Consensus at the speed of light, essentially, yeah. and that yeah. the I, I and we can talk about that more. But I wonder if like there are sacrifices that you know the trade offs you have to make on other things that you, you lose if you oh, only oh, focus absolutely. on that. Absolutely, yeah. There's definitely trade offs uh, across the board, and mm -hmm. we can, I'm happy to dig into them. Uh, but I want to give everyone else a chance to speak. <laughs> sure, sure. John, why don't yeah. you why don't you speak? Or Neil, go ahead. Oh, I just feel like, yeah, I definitely relate to experiencing that from the Solana community. Like that is by and far what they're most interested in. It's like latency throughput. And totally, you just posted this tweet, like what is Solana aligned? And it's like anything that reduces latency or increases throughput. And to me, that's very indicative because like it basically speaks to the values of the Solana community and the folks that are building on that L1, which is that like, for example, if they have to pick between Fire Dancer and Tiny Dancer, they'd pick Fire Dancer. Uh, where Fire Dancer is building a faster client that's higher throughput, Tidy Dancer is more focused on verifiability and DAS and fault proofs. And I think that's what's interesting about like allowing people to fork the code and making it open source because for the same piece of tech, people might have different goals. And, uh, and I think that's what Eclipse is effectively doing with the Solana code base. Yeah, just, just quickly for me, I mean, like, I, I guess the thing that I kind of start to realize, um, and especially like Eclipse kind of demonstrates this more, the, the whole like modular versus monolithic is like, we draw it as this like super clear distinction of these two completely separate systems when it really kind of isn't in practice and you can actually like kind of mix them together. Um, and like, like when we talk about like a modular blockchain, it's like Celestia being a modular blockchain. Like even Celestia does all of the things that like a monolithic blockchain does. Like it does its own execution as minimal as it is. It does its own consensus. It has data availability. Um, it's just like different layers in the stack. You can put them together. Um, so you can have a roll up on top of something like Ethereum or Celestia that does try to synchronize state as fast as possible among its own sequencers. And then you have this kind of slower path behind it that's used for other purposes, because that fast path is probably not going to be the most useful thing if we're trying to do things like data availability sampling, which brings in other trade offs. And like you start to realize as you play out like the end game of all these things, the boundary between them is like really fuzzy um, at the end of the day. And you can really like kind of mix them together. It's not this like clear distinction of like these are the modular blockchains, like these are the monolithic things. And it's, you know, two separate ways to build it completely. Yeah, it's a totally point earlier. Like, there's nothing that like a monolith, or like, that a modular blockchain can do that a monolith can't. Like, you can always just incorporate that code into the monolith, or vice versa. So it's it's not really like as much of a technical distinction as people like to make it out as. Yeah. Yeah, I and that, that and that's a lot of like the tweets that like Tolly's had that like I've liked on the like oh yeah like no one can stop you from taking all of Solana's data and putting it on Ethereum or Celestia or something else like yeah. now is it like now is it a modular blockchain or if I launch a roll up on top of Solana is it a modular blockchain now like it, it seems to fit the definition of like the way that we've called it um, so it gets pretty fuzzy. I think there's like you need like some engineering focus otherwise like yeah we can build everything. And then you build nothing, right? Like so, uh, as much as I can to hurt the cats, I try to focus them on like figure out how to increase throughput, how to reduce latency, and like obviously if it if stuff like Tiny Dancer, like add, adding features to support DAS and, and like sampling, if it doesn't impact latency or throughput in a dramatic way, we should add those features because they're good. They're obviously like a massive benefit to users. Um, and all the research that folks do in other communities, like especially Ethereum has been like an awesome, like just free free research that we didn't have to do. It's just been awesome, like part of open source development um, and like super helpful, I think for um, like across all the ecosystems. So like there's a, a lot of collaboration is happening across these competitors that I don't think existed any other time in, in software development like if you compare it to like how the 90s software development was done in a very proprietary way where people were like hiding their code and algorithms and afraid of like poaching like directors or whatever <laughs> uh it's just like 
awesome to see that like i have a really good idea i'm gonna try to explain it to all my competitors and convince them that it's really really good that's a de facto how, how people operate yeah i i love this discussion already and i think to add from the celestia perspective um the building off of what Tolly said which is anything that you know decreases latency and increases throughput i think celestia's version of that would be anything that uh, decreases trust or like increases trust minimization and increases throughput. So I think that that's like maybe the difference between like the philosophies is like we believe that blockchains are, are about trust minimization and um, and obviously you need to have throughput so that they're usable. Um, I think so. I think that's kind of like the, the difference. Um, I want to move the conversation a little bit towards to like bringing Eclipse here, right? Because Eclipse um, is borrowing components from each of these ecosystems to build something that sort of like benefits from the strengths of each one. At least that's the way that I see it. And so I think it'd be interesting to talk specifically um, about what we each see as the strengths of, of each protocol and then like why it makes sense to combine them and what the what the result is. And, and is it possible for Eclipse to take only the good stuff and avoid like the downsides of the trade-offs? Um, uh, so yeah, I don't know, Neil, maybe you want to open this this topic up. Yeah, the way that I think about it is like the big difference between Solana versus Celestia is, yeah, there's obviously Solana is optimizing th like purely for latency throughput. Celestia cares about verifiability. But I think it's also like the, the modularity of Celestia is more a statement about the market structure. And it's about like now we have multiple execution layers all on Celestia, which are all competing with each other, which impacts how development occurs. And like that's that's why... Like, for example, um, like when I think about a project like Tiny Dancer, like the Eclipse version of how we'd want that kind of innovation to occur in our ecosystem is someone creates a different a competing part of some module, and then they try to get us to switch to that one. That, to me, makes more sense than like building it in-house or trying to merge it into Celestia. Because like, like to Tolly's point earlier, like uh, the constraint on Tiny Dancer getting merged into the Solana L1 is all about if it doesn't impact latency and throughput. Whereas for like, I could see a world, like to me, rather than Solana Foundation funding that via a grant, a better, or maybe like the modular way that, that it could have been approached is someone forks Solana, does basically the opposite of Eclipse. They throw out the SVM and then they add DAS and basically launch a Celestia competitor. That's like the modular market structure version of how that would have happened. And then like they launch a token or they raise money off of it. So that's, that's what I like about modularity, which is that it encourages like, more competition like what i think is a more economically efficient way because the, the downside of the tiny dancer approach is also like what if that team doesn't work out like i think if they're a really strong team but like what if it doesn't it's not actually the optimal result and some other team could have done it in a more efficient way or like innovated more so th that's that's what we try to like borrow from celestia and then the second part is just the ethereum celestia vibes of verifiability and making sure that the end user can still verify every action that happens so we're, we're trying to like take Solana and preserve as much of the throughput and latency as possible with the constraint of verifiability. Whereas I think for Solana, it's somewhat the inverse. Whereas it's like preserve, like the constraint is maximize latency and throughput and then add in as much verifiability as possible. But yeah, happy to, um, you know, would be interested to hear like totally John thoughts on that. Yeah. Yeah, that like basically nails it. And it's awesome to see other folks doing research on verifiability because as soon as there's like a good idea pops up, it's like on the table for us to to try to work it in. Exactly. Um, yeah, you can always upstream it. Yep. Yeah, my my short answer overall to the initial like, can you just take the good pieces from all of them without like any trade offs? The answer is like absolutely not. There are trade offs for all of these systems. Yep. Like the Eclipse is not better than Solano or better than Ethereum rollups or worse or vice versa. It makes different trade offs in a way that like I find very interesting because it is a very unexplored space of. There are pretty strong extremes of Solana goes to a very extreme end of optimizing for complete latency and like the strongest real time guarantees. On the other end, like Ethereum rollups are very different. And like as a result of that, like Eclipse will make different security assumptions on its bridge versus, you know, typical Ethereum rollups. And like there are security assumptions there, but it comes with added verifiability and lower costs. So like it's picking what do you think are the best trade offs as they stand right now with the options available. But like there are definitely trade offs on all spectrums here. Yeah. Like, I mean, there are cases where something's just straight up not on the efficient frontier, but at least like for the leading blockchains, it's pretty rare. 
And I, I think like another interesting constraint that scroll and optimism obviously impose is full EVM equivalence or compatibility, uh, which is just different than um, than what we're doing too. Hmm. The way that I see it is, um, I tweeted this, I, I think of the SVM as currently the best in class execution layer. I think of like Ethereum as the best in class settlement layer. It has the moneyness, it has the liquidity and the users and the community. And then I think Celestia is the best in class uh, data availability layer. And so I, th I think that's a pretty powerful combination because you're able to uh, benefit from each one of those like features of each ecosystem or, or, or technology stack. And, and that's why Eclipse is so compelling to me. Um, so uh, I, I, I guess uh, you, you did bring up verifiability and I know that Tolly is saying, um, you know, that, that verifiability is important. It, like if there's something that gets innovated that, you know, it would be folded back into the, the Solana stack. I'm curious if, you know, how realistic that is. And like, is that something that Solana would eventually do? Like maybe support data availability sampling and or fraud or ZK proofs, because like I think we've, we've talked about this and, and you did, you have appreciated and, and said like those designs do make sense. Um, and so I, I, I'm wondering if that's actually something that Solana takes seriously or if that's just sort of like a, I don't know, still still a ways away. Um, let's see, the, the work to enable like SPVs and stuff like that for Tiny Dancer, that's already in progress. Uh, we're trying to wrap our heads around is it possible to like kind of reuse some of the work that we use for turbine erasure coding and use that for data availability sampling it's tricky because they one is like really optimized for latency and like fault tolerant real-time propagation the other one is trying to minimize the amount of samples that you that you need to take from from the blocks um these are like all like we're all debating these and like if we find that like perfect solution we'll take it right but like it may the likely outcome is that i think we'll have separate paths the, and like the data availability sampling path might be asynchronous with like in my ideal scenario there's a very fast way to propagate the block and vote on a fork and everything else then can run or runs asynchronously and provides those services without impacting throughput or latency. And that would give us like kind of a lot of flexibility and adding features that have these like mm -hmm. need bigger chunks of the data, take longer to run. And like, then we can kind of like play around with like, maybe you do data availability sampling on actually more than one block on like a chunk of blocks because it's more efficient and that's within the fraud timeout that the light clients need to wait anyways, like stuff like this. Um, so yeah, we're actually seriously discussing these uh, and some of the stuff, the early stages to support like Tiny Dancer are like already in, in moving through production. Wow, that, that's uh, exciting to hear. And honestly, that'd be a massive win for the space, I think. Um, Cause that's been, I think from my perspective, my main complaint about like this typical monolithic blockchains is that they are hard to verify, but it doesn't have to be the case. Um, yep. Like they can always implement these things. And like, I mean, like the risk kind of fraud ZK verification that they're doing for uh, Eclipse, that's very much like we can just port that to SVM. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like that, that's just like easily, it's, it's awesome that there's a whole separate team that's just like 100% focused on that. Um, so that there's that's a huge win of, of having them go do the R&D and build a product around it. Uh, and in my mind, like in a lot of ways, like supporting what Neil said, it's really good that there's a separate team with separate funding, separate product vision that actually build these technologies. Because if oftentimes public goods die, if it's just a public good built for the sake of the public good, there's no like commercial dependency on it. Nobody cares, like nobody uses it. And it kind of like rots, like bit rots away. A lot of really good ideas and technologies end up there. And it takes like a miracle like Linux or something like that to like keep an eco an open source ecosystem going where everyone continuously feeds back really good ideas and really good technology back back into it. Yeah, the fact and, that, um, that that Solana could then actually take this uh, uh, sort of fault proof thing that, that Eclipse is, is building and actually integrate it into the, the original Solana protocol uh, is, is awesome because it, it's kind of like what we talk about modularism, not maximalism, in the sense that modular chains or the fact that there's multiple 
people building different chains in parallel can accelerate innovation. And then those, whatever innovation works, it's like it's their experiments. And if something does work and proves useful, it can be like folded back into the original thing. So uh, in that way, I can see Eclipse being extremely beneficial to, to Solana. Yeah, and the tech can be repurposed in different ways too. Like the ZK SVM might be not used to prove every single transaction on the Solana canonical chain because that would probably be too expensive. But when you really do need it, then you can generate one. Or, or like another product that I find interesting in the SVM ecosystem is Roam, the shared sequencer protocol. So mm -hmm. that tech is going to be very useful for Eclipse for like almost simulating EVM rollups on the Eclipse L2. So like the, the same tech that they need for to make Solana into a shared sequencer is a tech that we were kind of scoping out for like a separate purpose. Yeah, that, that brings up another like point uh, I, you know, I wanted to talk about today, which is um, I, I think of Solana, this is like a lot of innovation wrapped into Solana, but um, SVM is one part that obviously Eclipse is borrowing, but then the consensus layer is another thing that uh, has been really heavily optimized. And to me, uh, now we already have SVM rollups, which is something that I thought would make a lot of sense. Maybe the next step is is to have uh, shared sequencing based on Solana's consensus protocol. And um, I don't know whether that that should be Solana itself or that should be like a new uh, shared sequencer that that uh, just take you know forks the code similar to what um, what Eclipse I, has done. I think this is where like. Um... Not that I don't want to discourage people from innovating. I think the core value that a sequencer provides is actually the physical decentralization of the validator network, like the boxes mm. and the people running it. This is where like you're trying to get like sensors of persistence and like reduce, uh, you know, increase MEF competition and stuff like this. And like, this is basically what we do day in, day out, <laughs> like look at graphs and try to like add more people to the network and like find data centers that an ASNs that Solana's not in and like optimize that. Like from a very, very kind of like silly example, imagine there's a Solana validator in every ASN in the world. There's actually no reason to have another instance of the network for that purpose of, of like information like censorship resistance because there's a box in every asn every every internet link is is in the same like network you know subnet as a solana validator you're covered right the, the entire world is covered at that point um so i like i uh, i would love to see like that kind of sequencer code running on solana mainnet and like anything that like i think would help them accelerate that any any like system calls that they need or something like that to improve performance like those are all on the table. Interesting, yeah. Like I agree with the end result that the shared sequencer should use Solana L1, but I don't think it, like the the reason why I find it interesting isn't so much about the number of sequencers because I don't think that we we need quite that many sequencers for a roll up, yeah. but I like the fact that there's already existing economic stake there. Because if you look at Astria and Espresso, in order for them to provide atomic composition between transactions on different rollups, they have to boot, they basically trust the builders and they slash them if they lied about transactions not reverting or both reverting. So like the fact that Solana already has that in place, I think makes it a really attractive option. John, do you yeah. have any thoughts? <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I mean, I've had some thoughts on how important economic security is and maybe not as important as a lot of other people think it is um, in these cases. I, like the, the main thing for me, I would say, is particularly for rollups, like you have a bit of a different trade off um, where particularly for like a, a traditional integrated chain that's entirely reliant on its consensus like Solana um, for basically all security guarantees on like all time horizons it then particularly makes sense to like maximally decentralize it. Um, but in, in the case of a rollup, you're, like you're effectively already paying another consensus for exactly those responsibilities on just like a slightly different time scale. So if you're already paying, you know, Ethereum or Celestia or whatever else for like the strongest possible security, including censorship resistance and liveness on like a slightly delayed time scale, the question is like, does it make sense to maximally decentralize the thing that you also need for that like commitment within the first like 15 or 30 seconds or is it okay to like make meaningfully different trade-offs to just maximize the hell out of the efficiency of this thing um and in most cases i tend to think it will 
Um, I don't think it's going to make sense for most rollups that like need any kind of shared sequencer that has like thousands and thousands of validators. It seems to be a bit repetitive in most circumstances um, for me. Um, but like th again, like there is value in it. There are trade-offs. You do make different assumptions on like real-time censorship resistance and liveness, and like that is what Solana is building in large part for is the real-time guarantees versus something like Ethereum that is building for like a slower, very strong guarantee. So it's different grades of finality and assurances, uh, kind of like different time scales. Yeah, there's a lot actually to be said there if you're doing like actual analysis of like how much. How much does it cost for you to run your own, like even you know, centralized sequencer that's very reliable? You're paying X amount of dollars per month. That actually pays for a lot of transactions and so on. <laughs> so like, so for like a for like most sequencers, it's just cheaper to just use you know Solana mainnet because like there's a lot of overhead in running up boxes, and if you can share that overhead with a bunch of users, you get a lot of cost reductions. It's not true every time. There's a bunch of, you know, caveats there. But like I'm also curious and like I tend to agree with John on like there's very little, there's no such thing as economic security. It's only like physical security that matters. Economic security could be an incentive to increase physical security, but like when the rubber hits the road, it's the it's the physics that matter. Um so like yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see how this will play out in the long term. So to to bring the conversation back to the original topic a little bit, um, you know, we have modular blockchains and monolithic blockchains. Typically, kind of a, the way that I define the definition is, you know, modular blockchain is a, a, like borrows components from a bunch of different protocols, whereas like a monolithic or integrated blockchain is one standalone protocol that does everything. Um, so that, that and that's like kind of a comment on the actual like technology stack. And the way it's implemented but then there's also a lot of like sort of philosophical associations you know within related to modular versus monolithic for example like role like fraud and fault proofs zk proofs tend to be associated with modular blockchains but they can be implemented in a monolithic blockchain like like solana or same with data availability sampling um there's things like app chains versus you know general purpose execution or like a multi-chain world versus like a single shard, right? Uh, there's also questions around verifiability. We already talked about that a little bit, but uh, sovereignty is another topic where typically like modular blockchains tend to be more aligned with this notion of like sovereignty, like developers and applications should have more control uh, and customizability. So I'm curious um, if these, like these distinctions are actually like it makes sense that they are sort of associated with modular uh, versus monolithic, or is this also another area where uh, it's kind of arbitrary? I think I agree with some of those. Like the sovereignty one, that's like a very cosmos idea, which originally applied to full like monolithic all once. Each cosmos chain does everything for itself, and I don't think you're like really fully sovereign as a roll up, I mean, you're, you're far from fully sovereign, right? You're subject to the fees of the L1. The L1 could theoretically like fork and like change the state of your bridge contract. They can they can like do all kinds of stuff if you're an L2. So I don't, I don't think it's sovereignty is really the reason to be on a roll up, so to speak. And I think it's sovereignty is probably the biggest reasons for app chains. Like if you're gonna do an app chain, that's got, it's pretty much the number one reason. And there are these rare exceptional cases like MakerDAO, um, such as like, even like the existence of Eclipse to some degree is like a sovereignty decision, right? Like we want to prioritize different things for the tech. So we like forked it rather than just trying to like build into Solana L1. So th that those cases I think matter, but it, it's not super common, I think for apps, especially. Yes, Solana is a sovereign roll up of Filecoin. <laughs> <laughs> so is it PowerPoint nowadays? Is that actually happening? Yeah, yeah. I think they they started dumping all the data there, so it's not not fully public yet, but it seems to be happening. It's pretty funny. Um, <laughs> I I actually think this is one of the unsolved problems, and it really ties to governance and coin voting and all this stuff. Like, it's very very hard to have a system that like people can all like agree that this is the rational choice that needs to be done. We all agree that it needs to be done. We can all do it. And it's easy to do it if we all individually do it, like and update our code. 
but it's very hard to pass a governance vote to do it. <laughs> and and it, like no one has been able <laughs> to fix this problem. Probably, you know, since as long as there have been humans around with like their own personal interests and, and put something to gain out of going the wrong way. Um, I don't know if it's fixable. It might not be. This is why I think like the reason for app chains is like a very strong, compelling case that is much stronger than performance on any of these other problems, which I feel like will become marginal within five years. Like, I, I don't I don't think there'll be any difference between using you know, running multiple apps on one Solana chain versus each chain with its own instance, I think should be indistinguishable or we're bad engineers. Like, <laughs> but the governance problem is really, really hard. Like, I don't know how to solve it. Um, you know, I think I'm like reading history of Rome to, to, to see if, there, if there's solutions, but it doesn't seem like there are. <laughs> Yeah, I, I strongly agree with all that. Like modular and rollups and app chains, like all these words kind of just get mixed together. Um, in general, I think like modular is trying to poke at the verifiability and data availability sampling side of things, which I think that as totally mentioned, like a chain like Solana can do that. App chains are a very different thing to me. Uh, like we just kind of associate them with a world of many chains. Um, but that is the main reason that I see for app chains is that like practical sovereignty aspect of like, yeah, I, figuring out governance is a really hard problem and the ability to like meaningfully coordinate a fork is incredibly valuable. Um, that is probably the strongest argument still to me actually for app chains right now is like, is that in the long term? Because that doesn't seem like a clearly solvable like engineering problem in the way that most other app chain uses seem like just hard engineering problems that you can kind of solve over time. Um, this seems like a pretty fundamentally difficult one where it's just like a completely different way of doing governance. Mm. Yeah. So John, just to understand what you're saying, you're saying that like, so the governance is, is just a fundamental problem that maybe only having separate, separate chains will be able to solve. But then the other aspect of app chains where you want to customize the VM for your use case is something that you could solve. You could still build the same thing eventually on, on like a general purpose execution layer. Yeah, most of them just feel like hard engineering problems, like the ideas of like internalizing MEV. It is definitely easier to do that in an app chain context. But if you get creative with the way that you're, you know, like auctions are done in like, like for liquidations that you can have a progressive auction where like most of the value ends up going back early liquidations for uh, like auction liquidations were really shitty. And like most of the value didn't go back and they were super inefficient, but like people learn those things over time and you fix them. Um, this like practical sovereignty aspect seems very, very different, like difficult to solve fundamentally. It's just, it's not just an engineering problem. It is token governance and like being able to change things on chain versus not. Um, and, and that's also why I've in part, I've pushed back a lot on the like sovereign rollups versus smart contract rollups, because I don't think that's like actually the important distinction. It's like, what is your practical ability to fork? And, you know, you can have a like quote unquote, like sovereign rollup where all of the money on that thing is bridged from somewhere else. It's a general purpose chain with a million different people on, it's got a bunch of USDC. You're not gonna fork that chain if like all of those other stakeholders don't agree versus like a single Cosmos app chain can be incredibly sovereign um, because it is like an aligned community that is like reasonably able to coordinate and like they understand like what is the valuable state there and we own it. Um, and like they have that practical ability to fork. So like that is a really important and like valuable thing. And I, I don't know how you solve that in a completely like general purpose context um, with a million bridges and all these different things mm. and the apps like living together. It's difficult. Neil, were you going to say something? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say yeah, about John's point about the bridge is basically that's something that imposes constraints on like how forkable you are. And that doesn't really change whether you're a roll up or whether you're an L1. Like either way, there's there's probably a bridge or there's a place where most of your money is coming from. So I was just going to point that out. But yeah, it just like reminds me of Kyle Solani's piece uh, about which it gave like a lot of good examples about how you can internalize MEV. And you can come up with these like gotcha examples where it's either like very difficult to do, but those cases just like aren't that common. And it, it just like doesn't really matter enough for that to be the main reason why you have an app chain. Because there's all these downsides of having an app chain or app roll up. And I think that the reason why people do that and the reason why all these terms got conflated is largely a function of the fact that roll ups and L2s, like that market trajectory was heavily shaped by Ethereum scaling. So that means that like they're trying to take the EVM, they're like 
even like the fact that rollups are considered a scaling solution is kind of like an Ethereum centric thing because the, the fees are so high on Ethereum. Uh, whereas like, I don't, I don't know if that's like inherently true necessarily. Hmm. I mean, to push back on that a little bit, like if it were so easy to, uh, you know, do MEV mitigation or capture at the, uh, you know, the actual smart contract layer, uh, application layer, um, why, why do we have things like, uh, uh, like uh, flashbots or um, well, the equivalent on Solana. Like MEV boost, um, or Cheetos thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Sure so the, like like the extra yeah. protocol things are not like, you know, the like Uniswap doesn't have some kind of like MEV thing that mm -hmm. they built in. They would, they should have if they could. Right. So what's, what's going on there? Yeah. I feel that like not just to like preface what I'm going to say, like non Ethereum L1 MEV, I just feel is really small to begin with. So like it only really matters on ETH L1. And, uh, and I think a part of the reason why Uniswap doesn't just build that in is because that would be a breaking change. Like, I think the community would, would fight. Like, I don't think that that's necessarily a good thing for Uniswap to change the protocol that people have, like, willingly LP'd into. Everyone's using it because, like, of it's partly of its simplicity. Yeah, in, in short, I mean, like, I think this actually is a very clear example of it very much is an engineering problem of, yeah, you started from, like, the most efficient, inefficient thing possible with super long block times in AMM, that's like a completely public, everyone's sending it to. And what are the continued steps of these different versions of hooks that like help you internalize MEV? Like V3, like adding concentrated liquidity, like reduces the amount that you're pushing prices. And out of the extreme end of like, you're starting to see with like Uniswap X, similar to like CowSwap is like, okay, we can batch more of these things, do it off chain. And like, there are different variations of like MEV capturing AMMs. Like everything is getting better and better and better and better over time. And we see that like continued march um so we see like what it is today of like what is the most inefficient thing possible like yeah there's a lot of money being left on the table and that's why someone like uniswap has a very high incentive to okay how do we internalize that more and that's why they keep doing that in every single design as they are internalizing that more and more and more um and like that seems like a reasonable expectation to continue and again like there will always be i'm sure unique cases where you fundamentally need to change something um, like DYDX is a very good example. Like we want the validators to hold like the order book in memory. Like, yeah, you, you can't do that on a general purpose chain unless you can tell the validators what to do. Um, but it, it seems pretty clear that those are generally far and in between, like those things that are pretty fundamental versus most of them are just engineering problems that keep getting better over time. Yeah, tend yeah. to agree there. Like even in Solana, you see like between order books, which have a fraction of volume that Uniswap has, like there's a difference between like open zero, open book and like Phoenix, they've op they've made optimizations that like imp improve performance and like everything's faster and you see a reduction in MEV simply because cancel messages are cheaper and, and easier to land. Um, mm. So like stuff like this happens uh, naturally as engineers just like keep grinding it. There is like kind of really fun engineering problems there. How do we like fully solve this? We have a bunch of ideas on like multiple concurrent leaders and stuff like this that are pretty hard, really hard engineering problems, but we'll also like, again, like each one of these improvements cuts the available MEV like by 50% or whatever. And eventually like you get to a point where it, I think you're fighting physics. Like there is some value in like being able to be first to synchronize information and like first reflect it on the chain and people should get rewarded for that. And that's actually, we want to make sure that that happens that like an attacker can't steal that information and steal those that the work away. Mm. So to close off on that topic, uh, it does sound like, um, you know, in the modular versus monolithic debate, like app chains and sovereignty are something that like, is more enabled by the modular architecture, but like at least from your guys' perspective, the app chain part is not as important as like sovereignty or sovereignty seems a little bit more useful of a feature uh, overall. Um, I think that's that's kind of what what you guys are saying. I, I just don't know if modularity really enables more sovereignty or like less sovereignty. I just feel because like, the Cosmos L1 is pretty sovereign, right? That's a monolithic chain, and then also like having a roll up, like you're pretty much dictated by how much like how many assets come from so, that? Yeah, so so I think what I'm talking about, so like I'm saying, uh, obviously if you launch your own L1, that L1 is sovereign, right? But I'm saying I'm building an app on Solana on a shared mm -hmm. state machine, right? Right. I think that's 
like less sovereign than a roll up. But but what um, about like the app on scroll? Like you, am you I could, more sovereign on scroll? You could like you could actually like take your state and go. This is like I think what people don't realize is that like you could have a token SPL token, you don't even own the token contract. But all of a sudden, you can say F Solana, and it totally sucks. <laughs> and you can actually take all your users and move them to Ethereum, to another chain, whatever. It's because the ultimate the ultimate test is the self-custody, right? If people own their own keys, you can then coordinate this. It's just much, much more difficult to do that the less of the stack you own. And I think like when you're dealing with a complex DeFi protocol, that has like billions of dollars of like real world assets. There is this like fear that governance token is gonna be able to somehow like attack these like RWA based like databases, right? Like that are very, very important for long-term like product market fit and, and reliability of, the, of this thing. So how do you make sure that like no matter what, the governance or whatever like cannot like go screw with people's money <laughs> it's just like there is no good solution there but like you still need governance to be able to do code updates because there's bugs and there's features and like computers change right like it, it's just like people will need to like re rewrite the code all the time um yeah that that's just, that's like the hard problem is that like how do you have uh you can always like fork Anyone can always, you know, look at the chain as public data and take it and go. But how do you do it in a way that like is incremental and gradual and like allows for these updates that are a benefit to the product without introducing an attack vector that could like completely blow everything up? There is no like really good solution there right now. Yeah, it's like related to problem. Like we can't just make an L2 bridge contract immutable. Like that that's something that like we could theoretically do, but it's not like a wise thing to do. Because you do want to have the ability to for governance to upgrade it, uh, and like like to your to your point earlier, honest majority assumptions everywhere. <laughs> no, no, no. It's still one of my favorite memes. I think it was Andrew Miller who had made it, and it's like the Scooby Doo like behind the yeah. mask thing, and it's like cryptography <laughs> and honest majority assumptions. Uh. <laughs> I think we're gonna all realize that like a really well constructed quorum is a beautiful thing, and like, yeah. and like there are actually ways that we can do that and like understand what makes good quorums and what makes bad quorums, and and like do a good job of of selecting good quorums. Hmm. Sounds a lot like regular like meat space governance, right? <laughs> yeah, <do> you know, <laughs> it's it's made of people, man. <laughs> yeah, I think I mean, I, from my perspective, it's okay to rely on a quorum for certain things, like consensus is unavoidable. Consensus requires a quorum, but like the validity of the chain, right, uh, should be enforced by the, the the users and and the people who have money and and like stake, like the stakeholders essentially. And if you offload that to a quorum. Um, the just incentives to break that are going to be so high for those like the quorum participants that like I don't know it's just not going to be a stable equilibrium. Absolutely. Like there's always going to be a threat that those people are going to collude and screw everyone else over because they have every incentive to do that. And like you know if we're going to put trillions of dollars of assets at whatever uh, like the most critical like coordination for humanity on chain, and, uh, and then it all just boils down to like a set of a group of people who can like rug it and uh, you know behind closed doors like i don't know i'm just not that's not a, i feel like that's not why we're here you know i don't know that's that's my i mean you know, i 100 agree with moment. you like you also like the best people to make a quorum out of are the ones that want better than honest majority assumptions <laughs> those are the best mm -hmm. participants <laughs> yeah like yeah. i i think these are like the the harder problems because they're not like clearly engineering problems um mm -hmm. and like probably why there's going to be a wide variety of of uh blockchains in the future you know despite my best efforts <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay so, so to shift the conversation a little bit um i want to talk a little bit more about sort of like the economics and value capture of this stuff and uh so i want to you know talk about what like eclipse Eclipse's existence and when it launches, you know, 
what what impact will it have on each ecosystem and like you know will it benefit all of them will it benefit them equally are there are some bigger winners than others are there are there threats that eclipse poses uh you know for example to solana l1 and uh you know building on that is like this idea of a value capture where to me if you use an underlying protocol and you, you know you're paying fees to that protocol uh it's a different relationship to, to like forking the code and 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 reusing the code right and and like a really good example of that is Cosmos, where like the, the code base, you know, Cosmos SDK and, and Tendermint, et cetera, are widely adopted, but like many people criticize the ecosystem for lacking value capture. Um, and so like, and like all that adoption of, of like of the Cosmos code has not resulted in, you know, value capture to like the underlying protocols. And so uh, I'm curious if, if there's a, a parallel here with Eclipse using SVM. Um, I know that like, uh, you know, on Bankless, that was kind of one of the positions that they took. They they they, they positioned as sort of like a threat. Um, obviously, we've already talked about a lot of the benefits of Eclipse to Solana. Um, but anyway, I just want to open up that that broad topic um, because I think it's a really interesting one to think about because it it will shape kind of the future of how modular blockchains affect the various ecosystems that they borrow from and build on. I wish further? every yeah. I wish every L one like. If, if the world was that Ethereum and its rollups were the only EVM chains and everything else was SVM, Solana, Baynet would be just so much more further along in adoption and value capture and like everything else. It would have been like, I think, like an amazing outcome. So people like from a technology perspective and like developer adoption and trying to get like somebody to build on, on your tech, like... I think the worst thing you could like what I wish all my competitors did is build proprietary blockchains <laughs> that prevented open source collaboration. That would be like the 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 biggest win for Solana. Like, yeah, take our code and steal it. <laughs> that that's like basically like adoption with developers is really, really hard. Like it, it's just like the hardest thing. And like any roadblocks that you put up there, like in terms of licensing or anything else will kill you. And like, there's many technologies that die because of that. I think over the long term, anything that doesn't have a moat uh, will get like kind of eaten away anyways. Like Ethereum has a moat around the assets that it's settling and it, it can have very slow performance and people still go there because it's the only place to settle those assets. And rollups will be more expensive than Solana, but because they expose those assets in a more native way, people go and use them. And that's a that's Ethereum's moat, and it doesn't matter to Ethereum if people copy EVM around. So Solana mainnet needs to have its own moat, and that's really hard to achieve. But it would be much much harder if devs just didn't want to use SVM. Yeah, for the like for the Cosmos example of not capturing value, I mean, Cosmos has a lot of mind share, but I mean, there's no value capture because they don't have users and value yet. Um, like, th like that's the reason why they're not capturing value. And if that happens at the end of the day, like here, then yeah, then obviously the same thing. Um, but it's getting to that hurdle <clears throat> is the hardest thing in the first place of getting people to care about your thing. Um, and like, that is how you do it. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, like there's in my mind, like there's clearly benefits to all three here for Solana, Celestia and Ethereum, just in all, all in different ways. Like Solana is that point of like, yeah, it's getting adoption. It's getting people to care about it. The problem isn't that, you know, Solana has, you know, that they're not fast enough or not cheap enough. That's clearly not the problem today. Um, like at all, it's just getting more mind share. Um, and like for Celestia, obviously it's beneficial. Yeah. Like you have a rollup that's using you, like th this is the whole purpose of something like Celestia. And then to Tully's point of like, what, like what, like an Ethereum rollup slash L2, whatever we call these things is like exposing that in a more native way to Ethereum users. Like that does make a difference to people when you have an alternative that is going to be significantly cheaper than other like traditional single threaded EVM rollups, but has the same kind of benefits of it's really simple and easy to understand for people to like, they have that same asset mapping in their head of they get to use the same wallets. Everything's denominated in ETH. You pay in ETH everywhere. Like it feels like an extension of Ethereum and slash all of these kind of rollups together. Like that does make a difference tangibly. Um, even if like it is very possible that I, I mean, we'll see when Celestia launches, but I would expect it's very possible that Eclipse is more expensive to use than um, Solana. The, but the question is, again, that like that's not what Ethereum users 
at least currently and other ones need because they're clearly paying more to a, a lot more than they will here to use Ethereum rollups right now. So that is clearly not the most important thing to them. So it's finding like what is the right trade off spectrum there. Yeah, and I feel like like obviously there's a direct benefit to Ethereum in that like we use put the canonical bridge there. But I actually feel like the biggest benefit to Ethereum similar to Solana is like this indirect benefit, which is that we're just encouraging more innovation on Ethereum. Like this is one of the probably like first like prominent non EVM chains. So just getting people out of the EVM mold, even Vitalik's latest post on enshrinement was all about ZK EVMs, like doesn't even mention other VMs. So getting that more into the zeitgeist, I think is, is going to be really beneficial for that ecosystem. Yeah. And, and why, so then uh, that was kind of leading to my next question, Neil, which is, you know, Solana already exists. It's already cheap to use, has plenty of throughput. Like why, why does Eclipse need to exist? Like, you know, what, what's new about Eclipse that like, if I'm a developer or user, like, why would I, why would I go to Eclipse when like there's Solana? It's like, oh, yeah. I'm going to build an SVM. I think the biggest is, yeah, it's for a different set of users, likely with more Ethereum aligned values, meaning like, verifiability is at the core of this and that's always going to be the constraint for us the second mm. is they get to keep their money in eth so they're bridging that over that'll be the currency that denominates like our nft ecosystem our DeFi ecosystem and those to me are the biggest benefits to users just like at first glance and then for developers this gives them another audience to tap into so if you're a solana mm. dab like you're going multi-chain and like it's that's what when like people are like is this like it's worth like asking the question is this a vampire attack and i think the answer is pretty clearly no because it's a second deployment with separate liquidity it's like often separate developers even but it gives them an opportunity to de-risk themselves rather than just deploying to one environment there's like definitely competition between every execution environment like everything that runs transactions is competing with 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 everyone else so, it depends like, on the specific user, right? Some yeah. users might just not be willing to leave Ethereum. So like, you're not competing over that user. Right. So we're, we're like in the, gra the grand game, right? Like we're competing for the users. We're competing for the devs. At the same time, like what's best for Solana is that like there's more SVMs out there because a developer will be like, well, I can build my code that's compatible with Solana and I have optionality. I can deploy it on Eclipse. I can deploy it here. I, I can deploy it there. And they're more likely to make that choice because a lot of them make that choice because EVM is kind of the de facto thing. And that's really, really tough to compete without either winning the entire market to where like the optionality doesn't matter or like you actually have like optionality and you give your technology away to like these other competitive environments. So that those are the trade-offs like uh if there was like a clear path for a proprietary blockchain to win 80 percent of the users without being open source and letting competitors like use it and like create optionality somebody would have taken that option already and done it i, I don't think that's just feasible at all like that that's just never gonna happen so like the only alternative is you have like you try to get your technology spread far and wide and you have something unique that captures value and like hopefully you're lucky that that unique thing is the one that the market cares the most about and you win right <laughs> but there's no guarantees in life right like we're all we're all competing uh in my view too like i think typically software has maybe at most six months lead on like like a software edge like if you build something in software if it's really, really important for PMF, a competitor should be able to get there in six months. And we already, it took a while, but we were starting to see more parallel execution environments coming out. And like, I think that's very important in the long term. And I would really rather not like, it would suck if there were like yet a third VM, whatever it may be called, that was parallel and, and like was also competing for developer mindshare versus SVM. I'd rather not be SVM. Like it, it's just, would be might even harder for Solana to attract developers if there was like another virtual machine uh, to compete with. So it's much, much better long term for like, I think any ecosystem that's trying to be a platform to be to be open. Unless you're Apple, and you have a monopoly and you can like kind of bolt everything down. But that's very, very, very hard to get there. Cool. Um... Well, I think 
I think that's a really enlightened uh, perspective. Uh, and I, I love, I love that Solana is so like open and embracing of, of like lots of people using the SVM. And I, I do think that's like strategically completely the right, the right angle. Um, I would have quit close. if I couldn't oh, build up. I would have quit if I couldn't build up on Source Code. I would have just <laughs> like out of here. <laughs> yeah. But as like a personal thing, like there's just no way I'm ever building something that's not open source. Love that. And I think that's something that's deeply aligned between like modular and 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 monolithic is like we are all aligned that we should be building open source code. Um, so we have a, just like maybe ten more minutes here. Um, and so I want to sort of uh, start to sort of wrap things up a little bit. Um, I'm wondering if based on the conversations today and, and what we've talked about, like the advantage of Solana, the trade-offs of Solana, Celestia, and Ethereum, um, are there, is it possible that each protocol could take a page out of the other's book? You know, like could, should, should Celestia, for example, enshrine an execution or settlement layer, uh, or should Solana implement... DAS and fraud ZK proofs and or maybe become like support some kind of shared sequencing or maybe should Ethereum get rid of its execution layer? Like what uh, what are some of the, the ways in which each protocol can kind of learn from each other or should they stay where they are in this in this trade off curve? Um, because those are those are kind of like optimal points. I think all I've, can learn from each other yeah. to some extent. I mean, like, and that's a lot of what we were talking about before of like, yeah, like a lot of what Ethereum is doing is free research for people like Solana. And it will be great to adopt those things over time. Like you can prove anything. You can add DAS to this stuff later on um, and add that kind of separate path if like that verifiability ends up being important to users. Um, as far as like the kind of settlement part of it, um, the, the longer it goes along, in my mind, I, it potentially becomes less important for Celestia to have like this quote unquote settlement in my mind, um, because like the, the whole reason for settlement is like, it's basically you're, you're just saying this is the place where our really important bridges, like this is where the assets are coming from. And there's just like such a large kind of path dependency on that that like keeps increasing. And like, that's the reason that Eclipse will in large part settle to Ethereum is because that is where the interesting assets are that people want to use ETH. People want to use the other ETH um, ecosystem assets um, in a native way, in a you know canonical bridge that like has these security properties, et cetera. So like there's a reason to settle there. Um, it becomes like less clear why you should settle to something like Celestia, when the reason that you settle there generally is because you find the native state there like super interesting. Um, and that is like less likely going to be the case, like given what Celestia's kind of trade off spectrum is. Um, like that there is naturally not going to be that abundance of assets and state that people like really want to touch into it uh, to the same extent. Um, and then Ethereum blurring from Celestia, I mean, like obviously both are building very similar things on like the data availability side of like Ethereum has a very similar. Um, kind of long-term roadmap to what Celestia is going to be launching soon too. And like both are going to keep building there. Yeah, I think there have been like massive misunderstandings around settlement. And John's been a, done a great job at like pushing back on that stuff. And we've tried to as well with the clips to explain like what benefit is it to be a settlement layer? And like we were, there was a version of Eclipse where we were going to try to do settlement ourselves with some sort of like honest minority scheme. It was incredibly complicated uh, and it was like, then we were thinking about maybe even like restricting execution and there wasn't much benefit to doing that. So like, it really comes down to, like John was saying, the assets on the chain. And that's why Ethereum is so good for that because there, there's just like the most assets there. Tolly, do you have anything to say? Um, yeah, I mean, like, this is kind of like, um ecosystems have a, like a lot of different people that are that are building and like moving it in every direction each one is like chasing pmf that are going to kind of slightly pull them in and up in like sometimes opposite directions um i think that like a lot of the ideas like as soon as something good comes out people will copy it that's just natural uh and that's really like generally good for technology to even have like multiple redundant implementations of the same idea like it, it really, you know, like you can get innovation just out of that too. Um, it, it's a natural process, you know, like, I don't know, like it's like what I remember working on Linux, it took like 10 years for BSD jails to 
like get get them re-implemented as namespaces. <laughs> Even though it was a really good idea and everyone kept pointing at it and saying, look, this is really, really awesome. And like, you can use it. It was a niche product until it like became namespaces and then like uh, Docker or whatever, like made a product out of, out of a, a man page. <laughs> so like when this stuff actually matters is like really, really hard to tell. Like there's a lot of good ideas floating around. It's up to like the each, each developer that's actually working in a product and chasing users to figure out what, what to pull. It's a natural process. Like I, I don't really see like if there, there's nothing we can we need to do about it. It'll happen anyways. Like as long as we're writing open source code, and even if you're not, as soon as you write something proprietary and it's good, somebody will re-implement it as an open source alternative. Yeah, I feel like that's actually what Ethereum does best with like their roadmap. It makes itself very conducive to people taking tech from other ecosystems like Cosmos, and now we're seeing it with Solana, and bringing it back mm -hmm. to Ethereum. So that that's one advantage of the direction that Vitalik has set for them. Absolutely. So to wrap things up, the last question is, you know, basically monolithic or modular or some secret third thing. Like what uh, is, is, is monolithic and modular? Are, are they actually useful distinctions? Is everything just kind of on like a, a blurry line? Um, and, uh, you know, with that, like, are all these different ecosystems competitive or all, are we all kind of building something that is can be collaborative and uh, is something like Eclipse uh, a win-win-win um, for, for, for everyone involved? Uh, Long-term, there's only going to be one giant execution environment that'll do native settlement because every BFT system does settlement. <laughs> <laughs> and it'll soak up all of the world's transactions. <laughs> that's that sounds that's like monolithic. I'm, yeah, so yeah, for sure. <laughs> for the sake of of uh, of the argument, I will take that position. <laughs> so I mean, so my yeah, my comment is I well, I don't even know if I believe in like one single like DA layer necessarily, but I do think like. Um, that uh, consolidation at the DA layer does make sense, but like execution, I feel like will be split up for scalability reasons, for sovereignty, for all the, all those different for application specific use cases. That's my position, but I do I do agree that like it makes sense to pool and uh, on the DA layer because that's where you share trust minimization. My, um, my my counter reason for that is that like DA is the easiest thing to commoditize. It's, it's just kind of data and people are going to care less and less about it. And if you can get stickiness around like a single gen execution environment, it'll kind of be like a gravity sink. Like, yeah, I want to, I want my contracts to execute there and everything else. Obviously like who the hell knows, right? Like, I don't know. <laughs> <But> like. <laughs> Like, yeah, and it'll change at some point. Maybe it'll be a hot thing that there's one execution environment. Five years later, it'll be a new narrative that like, no, we have all these like very highly optimized, unique things. And like, it's a technology, right? It, it comes and goes in, in waves. Yeah, I think that it's essentially what Ethereum is also trying to win. And they have this advantage that they just have a ton of assets there. So that's basically the Ethereum playbook. And uh, yeah, I tend to agree with Tully that the reason for execution to consolidate is that like you have smart contracts that compose with each other. Users typically want to be where other users are. If you're playing a game, you want to play a game that other people are playing. So you lose atomic composability the moment you have multiple execution layers. Um, and I, I think it just comes down to like, what does the community that's using that chain want? Uh, and like communities will certainly consolidate. If there were like an exact Eclipse fork which is like emphasizing verifiability in the same way, then I don't see the need for both of those chains to exist. Uh, so, but given the two chains have the same values and they're optimizing for the same thing, then uh, they, they should probably be consolidated. Yeah, uh, like at, at the limit, I definitely think the modular versus monolithic breaks down. Like at the end of the day, what is the difference? If you have Solana and they add this like slow path for you know asynchronous like DAS and ZK versus Eclipse becomes the one L2 execution layer and it effectively sucks up all of the data bandwidth of its DA layer. And that's the slow path 
for getting DAS and then proving after the fact, like, like what is the difference between those two pictures at the end of the day? It starts to like logically become, I don't know, like basically you have two tokens. I don't know, like I guess that's the difference at the end of the day. Um, and then the practical difference is that along the way, different sides are making like gigantic practical trade-offs on like, okay, where do we actually think that we kind of land on that spectrum at the end of the day? Um, and so like that, it is obviously clear that there are generally two directions um, of, you know, what is the direction that Solana is going versus if you're building an app specific rollup, like that is very different. Um, but at the end of the day that like these technologies can be shared across each other and like they will be shared across each other at the end of the day. And the best stuff will get used by other protocols if it is successful at the end of the day. I love that. Well, that was a good note to end on. Um, you know, I really, really uh, appreciate your guys' time. And uh, I think, you know, leaving this conversation, uh, we have a lot more like color and clarity on uh, the, the, this, this topic and this ongoing conversation about modular and monolithic blockchains. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see Eclipse uh, launch and see how that, how that goes. Celestia is also launching soon. So a lot of these things are actually going to become real and we'll be able to see, um, you know, based on this conversation, what, what, what the market actually says or sort of like where, where the, the, how things like play out. Um, uh, in reality. Uh, do you guys have any other closing thoughts or uh, anything you want to leave with the audience? There's no economic security. <laughs> that's a separate <laughs> podcast for sure. Yeah, that's a <laughs> but no, yeah. Uh, it's awesome actually to be in the space because of how open everything is. Like the, it's been really refreshing despite people think that there's a ton of tribalism or something like that on Twitter, actual developers, when they get together, we're all very much want to help each other. And like, there's been countless of times that I've messaged like Don Crowd and stuff, like, and he's and gotten an answer of him on, on a technical question without like, it, it's just an awesome place to work. So like, don't, don't pay attention to the Twitter maximalist fights. Yeah. And I, I think if I had to plug one thing, I think we've been pretty vocal about it, but we're launching our mainnet this year or the first for mainnet beta or whatever. So yeah, keep your eyes out for that. If there's any developers that are looking for a new environment to build in or looking for any kind of support, you can DM me directly or DM the Eclipse team. I'll just second Tolly's message. These communities, I think, are going to get start to get close over time. People are going to realize that, um, like Ethereum community is doing amazing work, Celestia community is doing amazing work, Solana community is doing amazing work, um, and they are going to start to mix together more over time. So excited to see that. Yeah, and I think that also if you zoom out, we're still so early in the adoption of this technology, and uh, it really does not make sense to like fight over. The, the the tiny pie that is, is like the current ecosystem and instead like focus on the win-win which is like let's grow this space together and share uh innovation and and adoption um and and be open and collaborative so um i i, I love that as a message to end um thank you guys very much thanks for having us thanks thanks nick <laughs>